is to the extent that you haven't invested in gold or silver and you or you're under invested in gold and silver, this is a wonderful time to increase your allocation. For people who are trying to maintain cash liquidity but, but are concerned that the purchasing uh, power of their currency is seeming to accelerate in its decline, uh, could you've addressed that to us in general in the past, saying, yep, I'd still have rather suffer a 10% decline than not have the liquidity to take advantage of a situation when it presents itself. Any shift in that emphasis based on the potential for acceleration of, of uh, devaluation of the currency now? None whatsoever. Uh, you need to maintain liquidity. You need to maintain U.S. dollar liquidity if you live in the United States. But you need to maintain it in short-term durations. Don't be a yield whore. Uh, don't put your money out in five or six year term for 10 or 15 basis points. Have the maturities, either demand maturities. Listen, there's plenty of banks out there that are paying three, three and a half percent on demand deposits or in very short term treasuries. Anybody can set up a treasury direct account uh, and lend their money directly to the U.S. government in maturities less than a year. Restrict your maturities, maintain liquidity, but, and do this in the next 60 or 90 days, if you don't own physical gold or silver, <laughs> if you don't have an insurance policy, put your insurance policy in place, not with 100%. Uh, of your, your portfolio, but with enough money that you sleep nights and stay calm. My nervousness is about the solvency of the system. My nervousness is about the response of the Fed to problems in the banking system. Uh, my suspicion is as the strains in credit markets increase, as liquidity decreases, the policy response from the government will be to increase quantitative easing. Donegan, as you and I know, quantitative easing is government speak for counterfeiting. You will notice that they provided $200 billion in backstop for the banking system without going to the credit markets to borrow it or without increasing taxes. That meant that they counterfeited it. Uh, creating new specious currency units does not increase the value of existing currency units. It decreases them. And my suspicion is that if the current difficulties that we see in credit markets, including the current liquidity, continues, that the Fed will do whatever it can to lower interest rates. If the market sees a continued conjunction of lower nominal interest rates, lower real interest rates, and increasing counterfeiting, that circumstance is tailor-made for the precious metals market. If you look right now at the arithmetic around the competition for gold and silver, which is the U.S. 10-year treasury, the U.S. 10-year treasury pays you a little bit less than 4% in a currency that the government acknowledges is losing 7% of its purchasing power compounded, which means if you lend the government money for 10 years, they solemnly promise to pay you, uh, well, let me put it differently, they solemnly promise to reduce your spending power by 3% a year compounded for 10 years. That's what gold is competing with. If the real yield continues to decline, that is to say, if there is declining nominal interest rates in the face of continued inflation, and by the way, quantitative easing causes continued inflation, I think you're going to see massive disintermediation from all kinds of long bonds. And disintermediation is a fancy way of selling, say of, say, say of selling, uh, and a redeployment to other assets, including very short-term denominations and gold and silver. The, uh, <laughs> the bottom line of the diatribe that you just heard is to the extent that you haven't invested in gold or silver and you or you're under invested in gold and silver, this is a wonderful time to increase your allocation, not at the expense of your other liquidity but particularly at the expense of bond holdings that you may have or savings products that have durations longer than two years. 
So we've been focusing just now on the monetary metals, uh, gold and silver, which some people consider to be commodities, especially silver. Uh, the commodity picture in general is a whole different chapter from everything we've been talking about in this financial world uh, is one thing. But it seems that most of the world, as uh, Andy Sheckman mentioned at your last conference in Boca Raton last uh, July, this East-West split, it seems like the BRICS Plus nation, which is now you can't even call it East-West split if, if Mexico and Japan are knocking on their door. But anyway... Um, the rest of the world is going away from this purely uh, paper-based or digital-based financial system and going to, th to real things is focusing on commodities. You focused on commodities because you've been focusing on, on natural resource investing your whole career. So can you bring us up to date on where you see the role of the, are we heading into this super cycle where commodities are going to be king for the, for the foreseeable future in the face of this crumbling Western edifice of uh, the financial world? I think we will head into a super cycle, although I'm not convinced that we'll head into it in the next two or three years. The thing that derails a super cycle is, of course, a recession, and we need an economic slowdown. I think in an economic slowdown, what you'll find is that commodities are already cheap. So they don't get proportionally more cheap compared to assets that aren't cheap now. But if you look beyond the next recession, uh, we have underinvested in natural resources for 30 years. We are going to have supply shortages, and we're going to have supply shortages throughout the natural resources space. P clarification, please. You just said we've underinvested in natural resources. I think, uh, did you mean in exploration and development of sources? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. A absolutely. Uh, we said this before, Dunnigan, in the copper business as an example. Uh, I'm an icon for copper mines. I'm old. I'm past my prime. <laughs> Most of the copper mines that we're living on worldwide were discovered 60 and 70 years ago. Bingham Canyon's 155 years old. Chuki Kamada's 115 years old. Grassburg's 60 years old. These mines are past their prime. They're long of tooth. Uh, meanwhile, demand for copper is exploding. Uh, we're going to have to pay the piper in higher copper prices, in higher cobalt prices, in higher zinc prices, uh, in higher oil and gas prices. Uh, all of these things. You can have declining supply if you have a recession or a depression and declining demand. But I'm a real bullish person in terms of the ultimate future of humankind. We've done a wonderful job as a species over the last 40 years, lifting the poorest of the poor out of dire poverty. And hopefully we continue to do that. Poor people want to live like you and I, and you and I want to live better. And all of that, the raising of material living standards of 8 billion of us on Earth require more resources. This requirement for more resources is going to run head on into declining sustaining capital investments in resource industries and 30 years of underinvestment in resource industries. This is a wonderful circumstance for myself and other resource investors and a somewhat more challenging uh, climate for consumers, <laughs> people who want to increase their material standards of living.